There have been yet more delays and disruption for rail passengers after thieves stole trackside cables in Essex. This time they struck overnight on the London main line at Colchester. At the weekend, hundreds of passengers were left stranded by a similar theft near Chelmsford. More hold-ups on the Norwich to London main line. This time not because of leaves on the line or striking train drivers, but vandals who damaged signal cable at Colchester. Train lines are bad enough as it is, let alone delays um, because of vandals. A total disregard for their own safety, let alone anybody else's safety. These network rail pictures show vandalised cables in the Colchester area. Metal thieves steal them to sell the copper. At the weekend, vandals struck here too at Springfield Green on the edge of Chelmsford. They were trying to steal aluminium cabling, but they only succeeded in cutting into it. But that still caused long delays. Roger Bloxham from Saxe Mundham was caught up in them. He wants compensation. No one told us there were any delays. In fact, the journey took uh, just over four hours. And uh, during that time, there were no announcements to tell us what was happening. Uh, any expected time of arrival, nothing. Network Rail says it's stepping up overnight patrols and copper cable is being replaced by less valuable aluminium to try to stop the metal thieves risking their lives. Well, it's uh, very, very dangerous. Uh, this year uh, we've had one person killed, two other people have had disfiguring and disabling injuries as a result of uh, trying to steal cable uh, from the railways. Today, a rail relic was puffing up the line. Given the modern railway is dogged by vandalism and theft, the golden age of steam now seems even more appealing. Gareth George, BBC Look East. MPs have written to the University of East Anglia demanding an explanation after emails at the centre of a row over climate change were leaked. Thousands of documents were stolen from the Climatic Research Unit. The Science and Technology Committee wants to know how it happened and how confidence in the unit will be restored. One of the biggest threats to the East Coast from climate change is rising sea levels. They're predicted to rise by up to a metre in the next century. That's on top of the risk posed by tidal surges like the one that struck the East Coast in 1953. Rare reconnaissance photographs of that disaster, some of which were classified until recently, can now be shown for the first time. It was one of the worst peacetime disasters in living memory. Huge swathes of the East Coast inundated by a tidal surge. It came in the middle of the night without warning, leaving hundreds dead and thousands homeless. A few days later, an RAF reconnaissance squadron took part in Operation Floodlight, photographing the extent of the devastation from the air. Those photographs are held here at the National Monuments Record in Swindon. Until recently, some of them were classified. Now, given the ongoing concern about the vulnerability of our coastal communities to tidal surges and sea level rise, they provide a fascinating insight into where the water went. We have literally thousands of this type of photography taken after the flooding in 1953. Um, but what you have to bear in mind with a lot of the photography is that it was taken three, maybe four days after the actual flooding. Jerry Matthews lives on the Suffolk coast. He hopes to secure funding to assess the archive's quality and make it more widely available. Its relevance to uh, current generations cannot be understated. You know, if we don't keep up our payments on flood and sea defences, it could all too easily happen again. And of course, with the climate change negotiations, it, they add greater resonance to its importance. So what we're seeing here is uh, Labworth Cafe on Canvey Island in South Essex. Now, we have a 1 in 200 year tide, so if we bring that up, this is a surge tide, and if we look at that same surge tide but with 50 years worth of climate change on, it comes up further, and if we add another 50 years worth of climate change on, we can go even further. 
Since 1953, huge sums of money have been invested in sea defences and early warning systems. But in future, yet more tough decisions will have to be made. Climate change may well change. You know, the rate of change may change, in which case the decisions that are taken will have to yet again be revisited and thought about again. The RAF floodlight photographs are a rare and salutary reminder of the havoc that nature can wreak. Richard Daniel, BBC Look East. Three years after a fatal shooting in Ipswich, detectives have renewed their appeal for help. Jim O'Plunkett was shot at the Zest nightclub and died later in hospital. A reward of £20,000 is being offered for information that leads to his killer being convicted. Drugs with a street value of £1.7 million have been seized at the port of Harwich. 25 kilos of cocaine were found concealed inside a lorry trailer. A 35-year-old Dutch man has been arrested on suspicion of smuggling. The UK border agency says its officers picked out the lorry, which was scanned and searched. It's only two and a half weeks until Christmas, and one village in Norfolk has definitely got into the festive spirit. People in Martham have organised an angel festival in their local church. These angels come in all shapes and sizes. The idea came from Greta Moulton. She was inspired by the medieval carved angels in St Mary's Church in Marham. I was looking at the angels on the roof and remembering how John Betjeman in 1972 paid an informal visit and so admired them. And I thought, well, they've been up there a long time. I'd like them to come down into the body of the church. I didn't um, have anything in mind other than asking people to just pitch in and get something made, something done, which was an angel. And they responded magnificently. I'm really delighted that in St Mary's this year we've used this angel festival to really tempt people in and, and we have had a good response. The project has been a great way for the local community to come together. They hope their angel festival will attract more people to their village as Christmas nears. Dawn Gerber, BBC Look East. Now it's time to go to Stuart, who's getting ready for the BBC East Sport Awards. Hello and welcome back to Tattersall's in Newmarket. Newmarket, of course, the home of horse racing. And uh, this is where they hold the sales. I'll show you some pictures of that in just a minute. This is where the horses will be paraded around before the sales actually take place. Let me just show you the pictures of what actually goes on inside this building that we're using tonight for the Sport Awards. It's where all the rich people come to buy their horses, to spend thousands and thousands of pounds on buying something that they hope might one day win a very big and important race. Inside tonight, though, we've got some of the big stars of sport in our region. We're going to be uh, talking to these guys in a moment. We've got some Olympic medalists, we've got world championship medalists, we've got world champions, all sorts here. But we're going to start with football because it is a very big night. It's a big night for Kettering Town and there's a big local derby as well. It's not the shortest trip of the season for Peterborough, but it's one of the most important so far for Mark Cooper's team against the Nipswich side, also in the championship bottom three. It's been the margins of, of winning or losing and drawing are very, very small. And uh, We could have won every game we've played. The best we've played since I've been here in the three games we lost at Sheffield United. And, uh, you know, the worst we've played against Middlesbrough, we, we could have won, and we could have won Saturday. So just tiny little things that we've got to tweak, and, and we should be OK. It's hard to believe, but tonight's match at Portman Road is the first ever league meeting between the two teams. But they know each other well. Posh ran out 2-1 winners in the Carling Cup in August. While Darren Ferguson has paid the price for Posh's slip to the bottom, Roy Keane has clung on at Ipswich. And in recent weeks, Town have begun to turn the corner. They're unbeaten in eight matches. The day you underestimate a team is the day you're going to get beaten. And uh, as I said, we've lost to Peterborough. We're, we're just a couple of points in front of them. It's not as if we're 15 points clear of them. We could take the game maybe lightly. No, no, we, we've got to treat, it, treat Peterborough with the respect they deserve. And over the last few weeks, they've shown that you know they're a good team. If the FA Cup was kind to Kettering when they drew Leeds, they nearly fell off their bar stools when Manchester United came out in the third round. But to me, the Red Devils at Old Trafford, the non-leaguers need to do what no other team have done in the league this season, and that's beat Leeds at Ellen Road tonight. I know that we're going to need a little bit of luck. Um, you know, we maybe rode our luck a little bit at home, but it was always going to be that way. I think they're a team that's going to 
certainly, in my opinion, walk that division. Um, I think they'll they'll go on and, and win it comfortably and they'll be in the championship next season. They're a huge club. The Kettering players don't need any extra motivation. Leeds in itself is a massive game, but midfielder Simon Heslop has got a bit extra, a one-time trialist at Ellen Road. I, I actually uh, had trials for Leeds when I was... So it must have been 11, 12 and got rejected after a long trial there, so it'd be nice to get one over on him. Luton also replay with Rotherham at Kenilworth Road, but one of the biggest selection dilemmas for manager and goalkeeper Lee Harper is whether to play himself. The sands of time are catching up with a 38-year-old, but he'd love to have one last shot at FA Cup glory. Jonathan Park, BBC Look East.